I'm a radiology major. I don't know what economics. I do. <laughs> I do. Kind of. It should switch over. Over. <laughs> I'm ill-prepared. That's your bag. It's your bag. It's a bag for the whole day. You got an extra you kind of yeah, um, go in my bag, the, the pocket that says I have a cat losing over now. Wow. Just grab the pen. We should have switched over by now, unless we have that much of a delay. Greg, is that stream public? It is public, technically. Yeah. So if like uh, parents at home who will access that. Yes. Would, would I just tell him to go to your page and then? I uh, he's actually he's got a bit URL. I posted it on my phone, which is playing the Pharrell music right now. Okay. Um, I'm trying to make my feed public so you can look at the page. Oh, there we go. Uh, look at my own So if it, you it's okay if it's behind. Go ahead. Do you listen? Can oh, you already right? already made here. I don't know. So, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, switch so if you were to send me that URL. Yeah, I'd be able to link that to someone else. Yes. All right. Um, copy it. Oh, right. I mean, oh my gosh! Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, just a little power to all that. I'm not going to launch the one. Okay, but it's hot on the blue. D L A M over here. P H. I E R. They're on your seat. Is that mine? Or is that up there? Are you in the middle? Oh, I'm sitting right here. I'm sitting right next to you. I'm sitting. Me and Greg, S A B slash I A C. Me and Greg know all about that. Yeah, Greg, everything sounds good. It's just very, I mean, it's very. I mean, it just now came up to me, and that. Oh, it's delayed. Yeah, it's pretty. Oh, I can't wait it's delayed. That's I mean, what I, I expect. Smooth. That. It's just, it's just behind. S A B won't let me be. So let oh, me be. Right. I'm I C. Trying to shut me down. You shouldn't hear oh, anyone right now. Yeah, you're probably you're hearing everyone from the past. Yeah. That's unfortunate. He's a medium. <laughs> He's a medium. <laughs> Wait, hey, are you live right now, Mike? Yeah. I mean, Greg, are you live right now? Yeah, we're yeah, live. Am I good with this? Or do you want yeah, me you're good. You're good. I have it all set up. Cool. I'm going to share your Facebook feed on my phone. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you can share it. Let's go. I'm going to sit next to you. Hell uh, yeah. I don't know. I think Chucky's going to sit next to you. Mm -hmm. You scoot uh, down more. You scoot down more. I'm going to go down this way. Yeah. Unless, yeah, I'm gonna, because I need to be scooted right over here. <laughs> How far back is the speed? I sit behind you. You're out there, so I see you. I saw you, sure. How do you spell Viskowski? V I S. K L not K L C L O S K Y B I S K L O S No C L O C L O S K Y Yeah. First big event. Don't mess it up. I'll just jump in. I'll just jump in. No, you'll be alright. Steven. Hey, I don't. I don't want to do that. I just hope I can like kind of be like, ah, uh, Dasha, would you like to follow up? <laughs> what you saying? This is again, yeah. He asked me any.
All right, welcome everyone to our very first event. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Rao, and I'd like to uh, um, welcome Representative Muskowski. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, our topic today is free trade, and free trade is on the same our topic today is free trade. It is probably the most contentious debate that is happening today. Mostly, uh, I would say, due to President Trump's first uh, on campaign trail, threatening and then completely throwing out the TTP and the renegotiation of NAFTA. It seems that ever since um, Adam Smith introduced the very idea of the elimination of tariffs. Um, there has always been a strict resistance against it and the belief that All right. terror also matters on the very first of the event. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Brown. And I'd like to uh, we, but I personally do not believe that that's possible. Thank you for coming. Um, um, our topic I am not for trade to the big and the trading has gone so far. Our topic today is everyone in the crowd problem the most one tension that is happening today. Mostly uh let's say President Trump on the first uh turn it on the campaign Alright, this question is uh, what Adam you Smith think is the very idea of the role of the tariff in the economy. Um, there has always been a strict resistance against it. Alright, uh, uh, as far as the general role of the federal government in the economy, I would say no. I would say that's possible. Our topic is the Thank you. 
enjoyed free trade agreements with Australia. Uh, I think by and large, although I can give you an example, so most of our European counterparts. Uh, but it is not always an simple subject. Uh, so I think this is something where you may have to say fairly in conjunction with the overall economy, uh, with the hands in your pocket and the eyes wide open. Thank you very much. Covered all many statements today. Yes. 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 Yes.
and they drove the price down so radically that her other steel producers so they couldn't get a fair price. So it was not all international trade, as in most things, again, uh, there tends to be a combination of factors that are involved. Want to stand on that, Dr. Al? Um, well, again, not just going, but well, we all know that uh, our region, I mean, steel has been a dominant industry and of course how it has also suffered because of domestic as well as the international competition, particularly when we talk about dumping. And I think I just want to bring in the role of China there. I think that's uh, very important because, uh, you know, China, uh, what they say publicly and what the practices they follow are kind of very different. So it's not really in the U.S. I think the, the dumping policies of China, are in fact, are the reason why they don't have there's something called the market economy status that the country gets in the international trade, and they are not able to get that because China often indulges into these practices of uh, dumping without kind of being very open about it. They follow all kinds of discreet measures so they'll be able to destroy the domestic, you know, the, the economy of the other country. So I think that's where the role of China, uh, China, of course, the currency practices again. We it's very uh, known uh, internationally. It's no, it's very uh, apparent to all the economies as to what's happening and to all the international finance experts that China has been intentionally able to manage its currency. So of course, so they would the cheaper, right? So that's the way to do that. If you maintain your currency at a rate that it becomes their goods are cheaper, then obviously they are going to get all the orders in the world. And I think that's where, it, because we never really try to manipulate our currency, so the result of that, the U.S. businesses can be kind of in that area. So these are the two things that we really would need to be kind of uh, explored further, uh, that needs to be discussed again at whatever the national forum is I think that's where the role of China, 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 well, what do you think we could do to bring more um, high-end corporate jobs, such as maybe Amazon considering us over um, Denver or Austin? Okay. okay. Well, uh, well uh, I wanted to follow up on Doctor's comment on you know, she raised China, and one of the impulses here that is driving people to violate international trading standards. And let's talk specifically about steel. We're in Lake yeah. County, Indiana. Yeah. Is, it is estimated today that there's almost 700 million excess tons worldwide. Myself, I think that might be high. Let's say it's 600 million tons. To put it in perspective, and, and that means you couldn't use an ounce of that steel for anything because that's excess of worldwide demand. To put it in perspective, if we poured every ounce of steel we could in the United States, maybe we'd pour 110 million tons. And, and, and I'm being generous. So you've got 500 million tons, 400 million of which is in China, looking for some place to go every day. So there's incredible, incredible pressure here. Uh, having said that, in response, I have spent my life trying to improve and expand the South Shore. I think that is one of the two keys of renewing our economy. Uh, I tell people well, we ought to stop feeling sorry for ourselves despite all the tough times we've had. We get bad weather in the winter, but we don't have hurricanes, we don't have mudslides, we don't have earthquakes. I mean, get over it. Mm -hmm. If J.P. Morgan and John Rockefeller knew they could make money here, why can't we? Somebody over a century ago invested money here. You're on the largest body of fresh water on the planet Earth. So under the Marquette plan that I've been talking about since June of 85, before most of you were born, open up the lake. Not 
to this place. Industry, we're very unique in the world, where industry just carpeted the lake, whereas if you look at Chicago, of course it took a great fire, they opened up the lake. But I tell you, as properties become available, think Whitey. Think 40s Lakefront Park, you talk about your dad at Midwest Steel. That was a dump site for Midwest Steel. And now it has added to the quality of place to continue to do that and to improve the South Shore. I am convinced you will draw that economy down from Chicago. Chicago's economy is larger than it swings. We are contiguous to Chicago, and yet since 1970, there are now over 73,000 less school-aged children in Lake County, Florida County, and Michigan City, because they don't think there's a future there. I'll give you one more statistic. On the Illinois side of the state line, there's over 740 miles of mass transit. 740 miles of mass transit on the Illinois side. 38 in Indiana. It's like somebody built a wall there. Now that's to Michigan City, as you know, South Shore goes to South Bend. What we want to do is expand the service to Lowell, from Hammond, and from the east side of Erie to Gulf Oasis. And as you probably know from news reports, and this has just been grudging every day since the late 80s, when Janet Moran, who was on the city council in Hammond, first proposed to find the West Lake right away, that was empty, is we want to take the South Shore to Dyers from Hammond, uh, and also to recapitalize, you've seen the term double tracking on the existing line. It's very dependable service, but if you get on a train on 11th Street in Michigan City, you get to Chicago in an hour and 40 minutes. That's not going to, it's not distance, it's time. You double track it in 67 minutes. And also remember, when they talk about double track, because in most areas from Tennessee Street in Gary to Michigan City, there's one track. So, first of all, and I'm an accounting major here. I was in the accounting club, I congratulate the international club. <laughs> I got two mass transit lines going each way on one track. So you got to watch out for each other. And the South Shore Commuter Service rents that one track to the South Shore Freight Line. So you have two, and that's a good thing. They get money for that. And that's helped subsidize public transit. But you got two freight trains. You put a second track, you not only reduce travel time, but you increase frequency. I spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. I took Metro four times last week. I don't think I waited more than three minutes for a train. That creates economic development. And I'm a manufacturing guy. I grew up in Gary. I live in Gary today. I want to make stuff. There's manufacturing in Chicago. It doesn't look like they're seven miles along the lake shore, but they make stuff, and those are good paying jobs. Housing tax affordability, we got some great school systems in Northwest Indiana, you don't have to put up an obnoxious billboard on the state line, those jobs will come. And I'm not looking to hurt Chicago or Illinois in any way. I'm just saying, we're the last undeveloped suburb of Chicago, come on down. Quality of life, quality of place. And so there is a future here. Uh, we're at a tipping point because in this year, fiscal year 19, uh, we're looking to get approved by the Federal Transit Administration for both parts of this project, the double tracking in Michigan City and the expansion. And we're literally a month or two away from seeing how that happens. But also for you, particularly the students here, this isn't a distant future. Uh, on the extension, we could be ready by 2023. Uh, on the double tracking, 2020, 2021. And, and you're in business school, you tell me. As soon as somebody with money knows it's going to happen and they believe it's going to happen, they'll start seeing money and investment in jobs. So that would be, I'm sorry to go on, but it just, uh, that, that's the future. The, the, to add to the, yeah, May I add? So last year, I well, Marcus, I think he's not, he'll be leaving us after he graduates and we need to make sure we can keep him here uh, so we can have high paying jobs. Uh, I was part of the group, uh, part of the One Region Initiative, so the five economies from the area. We worked together to develop a plan. How can we revitalize again, make Northwest Indiana another Denver, a Salt Lake City, a Seattle? I mean, of course, you have to dream, you have to look, you know, dream big so that we can move in that direction. And yes, one of the important things that we identified to make it to make it a knowledge economy where we can bring high-paying jobs is really the transportation. 
having a good transport system. This is what Denver did. In fact, Pittsburgh, who tried to revive, who have done so much, you know, they are comparable to us. Pittsburgh, they expanded the transportation, the big, big factor. And I really appreciate, you know, the passion which you have described it. I think if we can have a good transport system, that, that would be one of the starting points to look at it. There are many other things we are looking at. I just wanted to add that thing. Yeah, Raja, I just want to add as a follow up question. Actually, I've seen as a result of discussion both about infrastructure and about several steel firms are closed. Um, do you two see a distinction between firms closing and industry not existing? Like, like to me, for example, when I think of an industry that was destroyed, um, the icebox industry was destroyed by refrigerators. Um, there was no icebox lobby that essentially told people. Um, that you know, we demand that the price of refrigerator be so high that an ice box becomes viable. Um, should we not take that same perspective as it um, pertains to steel? Uh, the second question is the question of infrastructure. Um, if we're going to start building on these infrastructure projects, um, between the state and the federal government, who's going to be responsible for paying it? And what taxes or what should be taxed? First question about the uh, steel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, there is no industry that has ever existed, from my knowledge, that is static. And I have used this pen in testimony before the International Trade Commission on the theory that if we don't make things, it's not only bad for the economy, it's bad for our national defense, it's bad because we're going to be stupid. Because I tell people, I don't know how you keep the ink in here until you need it. I don't know what the chemical composition of the plastic is. I don't know what the composition of this metal is, let alone how they bend it, put it in, put this thing together, put it in a box and sell it to me. And next year, because they still want to be a business, they have to be more efficient. So the two things I would point to you is, yeah, you still have USX out there, and it still looks old, just like it did in 1906, kind of. But I bet almost half of the steel they're making out there today, they didn't make a generation ago. That is, it's different steel, because I have a 2000 Buick, and it rusts. You buy a new car, there's more rust resistant. The steel is lighter. Uh, the steel is stronger for safety purposes. It's a new product. It, I call it steel, but it's different. Uh, I also would tell you they're much more efficient. Uh, it just makes me angry when people talk about the rust belt. Because today, the steel industry uses almost a third less energy per ton of steel. Now, one, smart business, because energy is a huge component of the cost of a ton of steel. It also is great for the environment, a lot of less trees. So the idea that, well, it's steel or then there's no steel, it continues to evolve. Now, there's no ice boxes, although I still call it an ice box, because my parents called it an ice box. But I know it's a refrigerator, but there's steel in both of them. Well, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, don't yeah, know the I, was say, I think the first part is, you know, uh, great economist Joseph Schumpeter made the statement what is called creative destruction. Basically, you know, the economies grow with this whole idea. I mean, something old goes and something new comes up in the place, and that's what I think you're referring to. Um, we are using lighter and more efficient steel, and so it's a difference. So there is a technology that's playing a big role, and we need to be aware of it. So I think that's the part that I just wanted to say. That's what really talks about that's growth using technology, that's growth, and there's nothing wrong in it. it. So it only says that we need to kind of use other idle resources for something else. And that's where the role of the government again would come in. How do you make sure that displaced workers get utilized, get trained for something else? So the society as a whole tree, you know, is a part of this entire growth process. And that's what Which would lead me into answering your yeah. question on infrastructure. Yes. The first thing I would yeah, okay. address is writ large. The federal government is not investing in your future or infrastructure. Yeah. More than two-thirds of every federal dollar that is spent is for a retirement check 
Medicare for interest on the debt. Less than a third is spent on investing. Now, almost half of that third is the Department of Defense and 17 intelligence agencies. I'm not saying that's a bad investment. But that leaves you with a sixth of the federal budget for everything else, whether it's education, student loans, infrastructure. The administration has proposed an infrastructure bill. 1.5 trillion, it is the biggest and it is the greatest. And under the proposal, almost 200 billion would actually be paid for by the federal government. Who's going to pay for the other 1.3 trillion? Hmm, I would contrast that with the state of Indiana. And I would say, uh, to observe the facts, Congress is controlled by the Republican Party, as is the White House. In the state of Indiana, there are super Republican majorities in the House and Senate, Republican government. They did a great transportation infrastructure bill last year, and I fully support it. They invest in your economy, my economy in Indiana, and they paid for it. They paid for it. And I would simply add, infrastructure can be ports, and only a third of the ports, talking about international trade, are dredged to death. I've had plant managers in Northwest Indiana say, Pete, I'm shipping air. I'm shipping air in a boat because I can't get a ship in or out fully laden. That's wasting money. It's bad for business. Somebody's not going to work because what the government hasn't dredged all of the ports to death. Safe drinking water, sewage electrical transmission lines, air, I mean, yes. Dr. we have a list like this. And the American Society of Civil Engineers, and I'll be quiet, has given our nation a D on investment in infrastructure. So that's, I, I that's your say, future. I was gonna say, because I don't know if, um, uh, maybe, because it, it was a lie, um, but what taxes specifically? Because I know we have the gasoline tax, which is the, uh, the bulk of how states are trying to pay for infrastructure. And really, uh, but it seems strange that if states are consciously choosing uh, to not spend that money on infrastructure, um, why then would the federal government think that it was incumbent upon themselves to spend that money? Because the state is spending money on infrastructure. The state is paying for every penny of that investment. And for any federal program for infrastructure, there is a match. One of the reasons it has taken so long on the South Shore is half of the money has to be non-federal. Now, if you want to simply write a check for about $450 million, that would take care of it. That's not likely to happen. But the state has come up, the RDA has come up, local communities have come up, <coughs> counties have come up. I would say with infrastructure, I don't have the answer as to specific taxes, except we should pay for it and not for me and you to get the benefit of it and then have the kids of this country pay interest on the debt because we didn't have the intestinal fortitude to pay for it like the state of Indiana does. And what the administration has proposed is to invert what normally is the match, where it is 80 on most roads, although local roads are much different, federal, 20% local. But they're saying, oh, we're going to have a great bill. You pay for 80, we'll pay for 20. <coughs> where is Gary, Indiana going to come up with that money? <coughs> Where's the new community that just started out going to come up with that money? Mm -hmm. That is a function of a government. Yeah, it's hard to come and up with money. Sir, and it helps you get goods and services questions. to those ports and those airports. I'd like to state for the record that I was alive in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think I was across the street when you had an office in Sycamore, or one of those two office buildings over there that uh, where you announced the Marquette plan and laid out a map on a big yeah. table. I was there. Uh, at least that's what my recollection is, and I'm sticking with that story. Um, I'd like to hear what's your perspective. No one has been an advocate for Northwest Indiana more than you, and I appreciate that as a citizen. What is your perspective of why? We all believe Northwest Indiana, we always say, has a lot of potential. It has what you said, to low taxes, you know, great quality of life, a variety of things. But you don't have to be around the Chicago area long before you realize how, what they think of us. 
which is not very good. Their attitude toward us, the state line is a real big barrier. What's your perspective on why they don't see what we see and why they, I mean, we're, some of the suburbs that I'm going west in Chicago are in, in terrible places compared to us and closer and all that. What do you see the barriers to that? Is, is our psychology, is it you know, business, is it uh, our state government? Because they don't particularly love Northwest Indiana in general. You know, you have a perspective about that? And Dr. Al, did you actually want to maybe answer some of the question? Oh, okay. Well, I think this was directly well, addressed to him, but uh, just the perception part of it, I think. Um, so I think you're really, uh, if I understand it, the question is, um, the perception about Northwest Indiana. Um, yes, these are, I think what happens is when sometimes the, there is a huge economic uh, distress that the Northwest Indiana went through. So I think we are always thinking of Northwest Indiana starting with places like Gary and looking at it and trying to see. But there are nicer parts of it and I, I think one of the things that we as a group struggled at that time is the biggest thing that we need, biggest challenge for us to uh, reinvent, revitalize is how do we market ourselves as a place to be? You can work in Chicago, but live here. This is so much nicer. So I think this is really one of the key components of what we came up and saying, how do we work towards changing the perception? And you know, this is like uh, changing value system, culture. These are really much harder to do. But we hope if we keep on saying it, hundred times, probably it would make a difference. So we are really working on it. How do you change the perception of people in Chicago and around the Northwest Indiana is really a good place to live and it has a great potential. So we need to say that several times and you know, it's like this, the message, do it. And maybe we need to have some bots going on the social media saying we are a great place to live, but right. might change the perception. We do want to market ourselves. Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, I, I would just well. say uh, I have no idea what an individual's perception is in Illinois, and I don't mean to be cold about it. I don't care. What I'm very concerned about is the uh, attitude of psychology in Northwest Indiana, which has been very negative, uh, very down on itself, and uh, it is time for us to get over it. Uh, I told people, I, I grew up in Glen Park, I went to college in Glen Park, I live in Gary today, this is a great place. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. My parents never whined once. My dad, dad died in December of 1929. He finally got out of Lou Wallace High School when he was 22 years old. And he's a smart guy, but he had to go work for a while. They never want to get to work. If they had a problem, they just worked harder. We have every freight line that goes east and west in the United States of America goes through three counties in northwest Indiana. Because they've got to get around the Great Lakes. Largest body of fresh water. Gary, Indiana. You know how many interstates are in Gary, Indiana? Four. I've got colleagues living in some of the square states out west. They died to get a second interstate in their congressional district. So let us dust ourselves off and let us get going. And the second somebody with some money sees they can make money here and invest money, because now I can get from Miller and Gary to Chicago in 48 minutes. I don't want to be the last person in. I don't want to be the last person in. And you're going to see that investment. You're seeing young people, you know, two in their 20s buying beater houses in Michigan City because now they believe, they believe the South Shore is going to happen. Now fix it up and maybe summer, but maybe it'd be worth something someday. And I have visited two plants in Gary, Indiana. I'm working with metals because that makes sense. Why are they here? Taxes primarily, cost to do a business, what have you. I'm more worried about the psychology here. But you and and I can't tell you. On the South Shore, and I hate to whine, and I know we're recording this, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had. When I give the statistic 470 miles on one side, well, that's Chicago. I go, what? Like, I can't do it here? Don't tell me I can't do it. Don't tell me that. Uh, yeah, we want to been at this for an awfully long time, and, and then you've been at this for a long time. And, and, and the Marquette plan has taken, I mean, what a great idea, and, and perfect. It's taken you a lot. Your success is one acre at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I know we got another question. No, 
uh, I'm also committed. And literally, we started on the South Shore in the late 80s. Janet Moran, a city councilwoman uh, in Hammond, had the idea to buy a right of I'm also convinced once some of you stay here and others your age, and I don't care who moves here as long as they're spending money here, okay, but some young people are here again. They're not going to put up with doing nothing for 30 years. And that next sequence of change and investment and improvements are going to be made more rapidly. And if you look around the quality of local officials, you look at the lakefront in Hobart today, you look at the lakefront in Whiting, you look at other communities, it is getting better. Thank All right. So yeah, we don't have much time. I'm just going to jump to uh, my last question, um, which is directed to you. Uh, what, is, what is the line between voting uh, based on your own beliefs and voting on your district? You're so, <laughs> Uh, voting uh, to represent Northwest Indiana, I would tell you, is trying to act with an informed judgment. That would be the easiest way I would describe how I vote. Uh, we probably vote almost 800 times on a recorded basis in the United States Congress. I would tell you right off the bat, a third of those uh, are procedural votes. Another third are to make a political point. Do you like apple pie? Yes. I mean, literally, we have those kind of votes. And then there's a couple hundred that really matter. And uh, I truly try to inform myself and vote in what I think is the best interest, one, of the people I represent, because nobody else is represented in the first district. And the state of Indiana, we are part of the state of Indiana, uh, and our nation, and internationally, because I have uh, responsibilities for the Department of Defense and the 70 Intelligence Agency. This is very broad thing. So at any one point, there are a lot of moving parts. One of the, there's so many great privileges you have given me. And one of them is just working through those matrices on each one of these votes. So it's not just, what do I think, or what did Dan Mon tell me to do, or what I think is politically expedient. Uh, I try to act with some independence. If I'm too independent and I get out of sync with the district, I'm not going to be here next year talking to you. Good. Yeah, I think we can go to some questions, Marcus. All right, so to wrap up um, what Pete said and what Dr. Rao said, um, Dr. Rao had mentioned that I'm leaving when I graduate. I'm moving to LA. Um, as a gay citizen in Indiana, um, we know um, my friends didn't have the best track record. Um, and I had friends in Chicago not wanting to visit our state. I had friends both overseas and here saying they didn't want to visit our state. Um, and one of the main driving factors for me to leave was I don't feel welcome here in the state of Indiana. Um, not saying personally, but I feel like our local and state and federal governments kind of have the attitude that as a gay man, I don't have any rights. Um, and some of those rights include I can legally be evicted from my apartment in the state of Indiana for being gay. I can legally be fired in the state of Indiana for being gay. And thanks to our current administration, legally a Christian can deny me service based off of their religious belief that I am gay. So my question is, um, what are you doing to fight for our LGBTQ citizens, both future generation and current generation, to keep us here in the state? Well, absolutely. And I would just add that elections matter. And also, no election law that I know of is really going to fundamentally change in the next three years. Uh, but there's five elections between now and the next time we all get to vote for who the President of the United States should be. And there's many building blocks. And I've mentioned twice, and I've mentioned it again, if we, if we just had a just society and a tolerant society and, and maximize the human capital that is available to all of us, we'd be a lot better off. And in the end, the policies you know that you disagree with uh, are enacted by people who are elected. And we can talk about that for the rest of the evening, but it's an issue of people, whatever your beliefs are, uh, exercising your franchise and becoming involved in the process. Sir? Mr. Ostrowski, about 30 years ago, I'm dead this one. I wish you a long life, but I told you you will die now. <laughs> <laughs> Not any time soon. Because, yeah, no. Because uh, you will get reelected as long as you want. 
<laughs> Anyone who has that belief is not in public office for it. <laughs> uh, public office is a great vocation in life. Uh, I had made that decision when I started my education here at IUN. Uh, I think it's one of the great vocations in life because you can have the potential to leave the world a tiny bit better than you found it. And it's very, very, for all the frustration, it's very rewarding. But anybody in any elected office who thinks there's some God-given right, I remind myself, my mentor beat the chairman of the House Rules Committee. They said the same thing about Senator Luther. I can remember John Bradamus in South Bend was going to be Speaker of the House because he was whip of the Democratic Party. And in 1980, John was gone. And I have a whole list of people like that, including the Speaker of the House, Tom Foley. Who lost an election in the district? So I just try to work hard every day. <laughs> and I own two treadmills. Very important. Was there any more questions? One more? Go ahead. I used to work at the Nip Store Generating Facility in Bailey, and they're shutting down some of their facilities in Northwest Indiana. One of the reasons why is because other management told me that. EPA regulations are hindering them from operating at 100% capacity. Now, I know that some other workers in the country are worried about EPA regulations too. Do you think any of them need to be changed or should companies just update their facilities to meet the current requirements? I would suggest a lot of problems that people face with coal for the generation of electricity uh, and nuclear for the generation of electricity has been caused by the low price of natural gas. And I'm not saying that's the only one. I would also not suggest to any of you that I think EPA, any more than I, am perfect. But I would suggest to you, from my perspective, EPA creates jobs. Because I did grow up three blocks from this building. I do live in this city. And the Grand Calumet River was 90% industrial discharge for almost 100 years. So, we could do the training, we could do job training, we know who's going to live there. We cleaned up almost all of it, we've got four reaches to go. EPA, Great Lakes Initiative that helped pay for that. We have had MITGO 1, MITGO 2. I have a whole sheet this long of Superfund sites in the 1st Congressional District, some of which now are closed and safe for our very health and safety. Others are under construction. Everybody here in the media is familiar with the situation in East Chicago. That's a work in progress. If we didn't have EPA, well, let's, let's just sit there. Now, should we always look to find that balance to make sure we are safe, but we aren't impeding business? I'm not saying, again, it's perfect, but the idea that every bad thing that happens with a business is EPA's fault, I would categorically argue. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it was the environmentalists that kept us from having a nuclear plant. And they were the And that was uh, too bad, in my view. Uh, because every time I passed by the big uh, pile of coal in Michigan City, I get zapped. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to finish up uh, today. Um, I, I'm going to introduce uh, Michael. It's going to have some closing statements. Uh, um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rao and Representative Vespasi for coming out today to have a discussion on free trade. I would also like Dylan um, for thank you for moderating. I'd also like to thank our wonderful faculty advisor, Jean Pilar, <laughs> for uh, continuing helping the International Affairs Club. And I also thank, well, thank everyone else for coming out today for our event. Good luck with your club. Is there an accounting club here? Um, <laughs> we do actually have one. Have to add this answer that so we have a business and economics students together club that takes so that's the accounting and the business students are part of that. And in fact, we're having an event day after tomorrow. We have an uh, executive director from U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce to talk Whoa. about NAFTA. Uh, this is on Thursday at 5:30. 
Um, so, of course, everyone's invited. I'd be happy to send you the invitation for that. So we are, because the students are really wanting to know about, you know, NAFTA, the negotiations are on, and we're just wanting to know how it's likely to impact. And I did bring some, a few ten sheets of paper about how trade has benefited Northwest Indiana. I only made ten copies. You can look at it, how many jobs, you know, it's, it has helped uh, increase for the region. That's generally because of how the trade helps. So here's some information. Maybe you can share it with the club members. I did have one more question. Um, Go ahead, Representative. I was wondering, um, as it pertains to NAFTA, did you have a problem with the entirety of the um, agreement, or did you, um, or, or did you not like uh, Mexico being a part of it? And would you have preferred NAFTA if it was only between Canada and the United States? Uh, my primary objection to NAFTA, and I voted no, uh, was the lack of labor standards. Well, I want to say, if, but if all a poor country has is, it, is that the individual members living there are willing to work for less money. I don't care what your living standard is, and I don't care how poor rich you are, you should treat a person's labor with dignity. And that was lacking. I would say compared to what, though? Because it's one thing if you... Oh, no, 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 not to kind of say compared to what. I think there is some kind of a minimum uh, standard that you would have. And that's the point of, you know, that uh, we are not trying to impose our standards on other countries, but certainly, you know, you be, again, labor exploitation in one part, and then that having a negative impact on our own employment. And I think that certainly cannot be. That's really the point. But, but, but if that's all they have, but if all you have is the ability to work for less money, that's the only leverage you have, because Mexico doesn't have the capital, I they, would, they don't have the... I would categorically uh, suggest there is more to working conditions than the pay you get. Yeah. Well, simply because you are paid very little and you are in a poor country, uh, if you are being poisoned by the air in your facility and your employer is not going to lift a finger to change that, if you're in an industrial situation and you get injured or hurt because no one is trying to encourage and implement basic safety standards, that's part of labor standards as well. Um, I totally agree. You can't really have, you know, the carpet weaving industry in so many countries with by children and basically ILO intervened and said you cannot really allow this exploitation and you really don't want to be, I mean, I don't want to wear a sweatshirt that's made by people who are living working in really horrible conditions because as a human being i think that that really bothers me and so tpp the way it was being uh, written i think there were uh, provisions for um, better labor standard uh, contracts but of course that's gone so well, i would say short of enslavement if um you make the choice between <laughs> making like a one or two dollars and ten dollars but you don't, um, but you may not have like the best facility. If, if people are consciously, again, the people there are clearly making a trade off. If that's all they can do, they're making a trade off. And if we say, well, no, 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 you can't make that trade off, we will impose a tariff on you, then we have destroyed completely any willingness to invest in a poor country. Because why would you ever do it? If, if you know that the one piece of leverage they have, they can't utilize, then we'll just continue to produce at a minimum level in our country. To diminish a person's health in a workplace is not leverage, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mark, just one yeah. last yeah. question today. <laughs> one, one final question. Yeah. So, um, I believe the current administration just passed a heavy tariff on um, solar panels and the manufacturing of yeah. solar panels. Um, and I know Tesla was a big component of, yeah, we want to get you know our solar, solar panels on everybody's homes, which you know that job, creates job. a lot of jobs and a lot of money. Do so what you could we leave. do to kind of yeah. maybe undo that yeah. tariff that the current administration placed? Because solar panels and installing them, making them, delivering them, that's a lot of jobs. And they're that's good right. paying jobs. I would suggest all of these issues uh, impact different manufacturers and installers differently. Uh, literally at one o'clock this afternoon, I'm at Michigan City for a Clean Cities event and talked to an installer of solar panels and he never complained about that. He was mm -hmm. talking about his business is better. Okay. Well, oh. But I would suggest if you have an opinion about it, you should write me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a senator. <laughs> That's how you affect policy. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you, Peter.
Okay.